Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, thanks for joining me for this presentation on Clostridiotis difficile, flush the myths and learn the facts. I'd like to thank Metrics for sponsoring this presentation. I appreciate their commitment to providing continuing ed. <clears throat> now, I am an independent infection prevention consultant, and I am a paid consultant for Metrex. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe Clostridioides difficile, C. diff, identify the risk factors for acquiring it, discuss its mode of transmission, explain the hand hygiene recommendations when caring for patients with C. diff, and discuss environmental cleaning and disinfection to prevent its spread. Now, a little background. <clears throat> Clostridioides, C. diff, is one of the two most common healthcare-associated pathogens and the number one cause of infective diarrhea. The other HAI pathogen is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA. Now, C. diff is a gram-positive, spore-forming, anaerobic, toxigenic, opportunistic, rod-shaped organism. So let's break those down. Spore forming means it can produce a dormant and highly resistant cell or spore, which is its inactive form, which can live in an oxygen environment. Anaerobic is its vegetative or its active form that can only live without oxygen. Toxigenic means it can produce substances that damage the host. Those are toxins, and it's mainly toxin A and B. Opportunistic means it's a pathogen that can cause disease when given the chance, like uh, host altered immune status. Now, the species name was chosen to imply how difficult it is to isolate and culture. Pretty clever, difficile. It's commonly found in water, air, soil, human and animal feces, and it can be found in healthy people where it causes no symptoms. Now, it was first isolated in 1935 in the stool of a healthy infant. And it wasn't until 1978 that it was that it was thought to be pathogenic. Prior to that, it was thought to be non-pathogenic, but it was identified in 78 as a source of toxin in the stools of patients with colitis and the organism responsible for most cases of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Its primary mode of transmission is the fecal-oral route. Now for our first poll question. All Clostridioides difficile strains produce toxins. Is it a myth or, it a, or a fact? You tell me. <clears throat> How are we doing there, Mary? Good. Um, we're getting a lot of results right now. Okay. So, ah, it is a myth. All clostridioides to facile strains produce toxins. Uh, that is correct, and we're going to examine that a little more closely in the next slide. Now, C. diff has two forms. It has that vegetative active form, which can't survive in oxygen, but it does produce toxins. And it has that dormant spore form, which can su survive in oxygen, but it cannot produce toxins. Now, to answer your question, most pathogenic strains, about 80 to 90%, produce toxin A and B. Strains that don't produce toxin are unable to cause disease. Now, toxin B is found in all strains and toxin A in 70% of strains. The spores are more resistant to intense heat, dryness, harsh conditions, and alcohol-based cleaners than that vegetative form. So the spores are really a way for C. diff to survive during hard times. And if surfaces aren't cleaned and disinfected regularly with a sporicidal product, that spore form can survive for a very long time. Now, the success of C. diff as a pathogen is really due to its life cycle. Most of the time, our gut flora protects us from it by controlling nutrients and even the space in the intestine, releasing products that inhibit its growth or kill it. 
However, when there's distress to gut flora, usually because of antibiotics, it weakens these barriers to C. diff. And C. diff survives the oxygen-rich world outside the gut by forming spores, which are shed through feces. Without good hand hygiene and cleaning and surface disinfection, those spores can contaminate hands, surfaces, and even food where they're unintentionally passed from one person to the next. <clears throat> now, once ingested and safe in the host intestines, those spores germinate into vegetative cells. And it's during this vegetative phase that there's destruction that disrupts the intestinal barrier and promotes inflammation. After its vegetative phase, it reverts to its spore form. And the new spores are shed into the environment where they kind of bide their time until a new host comes along and that cycle continues. Now, Clostridioides difficile infection, which we'll refer to as CDI, is the leading cause of antibiotic and healthcare associated infective diarrhea in the United States. So once established, C. diff can produce toxins that attack the lining of the large intestine. Rarely, though we're seeing it more often, it's been found to infect the small intestine too, and that's called C. diff enteritis. Now, the clinical presentation varies from asymptomatic colonization to mild diarrhea to severe debilitating disease or even perforation. Symptoms can begin within five to 10 days after starting an antibiotic, but symptoms can also occur as soon as the first day or up to three months later. Now, symptoms in mild to moderate CDI are watery diarrhea about three or more times a day for more than one day. There's mild belly cramping and tenderness. Some of the symptoms of severe CDI are watery diarrhea as often as 10 to 15 times a day. There's belly cramping and pain, which can be severe. Because of using the restroom so often, there's dehydration, swollen belly, there can be kidney failure, sepsis, and toxic megacolon, which is when the colon becomes inflamed and it sometimes forms patches of raw tissue that can bleed or produce pus, like that photo on the slide. And rarely, it can cause death. Now, fortunately, toxic megacolon and sepsis aren't common with CDI. So we're on to our next poll question. C. diff infection is more common than C. diff colonization. Well, we don't know which one is the myth and which one's the fact. So choice one is the myth and choice two will be the fact. <clears throat> Just to confuse you. Let me know when we're ready, Mary. C. diff infection is more common than colonization. So that was our myth. You're correct. Colonization is more common than infection. And we're going to explore that. After we answer this one, C. diff spores are only shed from patients with an active infection. Now, I tried to put some music in the background while we did this, but Zoom doesn't want to support it. All right, myth. C. diff spores are only shed from patients with active infection. You guys are really up to speed on C. diff. Let's look at this some more. Okay, CDI, remember C. diff infection, is the symptomatic disease that causes C. diff when it produces toxins in the colon and patients with the infection show clinical symptoms. They do test positive for the C. diff organism or its toxins, and they require treatment. Now, colonized patients don't have the disease caused by C. diff, and they often have no clinical symptoms. They do test positive for the C. diff organism or its toxins, and they can remain colonized for several months. And you're correct, colonization is more common than infection, about 18% of healthy adults are colonized. Now, 
C. diff transmission can happen from people with an active infection and from people with asymptomatic colonization. And colonized patients that don't develop an infection, they do shed C. diff spores, and those spores are shed at environmental contamination rates similar to those with active CDI. So they are a source of infection for others. Now, 50 to 70% of people who acquire C. diff in a healthcare setting remain asymptomatic, but the remainder that fail to mount an antibody response against it develop CDI in typically less than seven days. Now, long-term care IPs probably already know that up to 50% of long-term care facility patients are colonized, so they're shedding those spores in their stool. And colonization is one of the main drivers of C. difficile dissemination. Now, the burden of C. diff in healthcare, it's not just clinical, which is what we tend to focus on. It's also economic and social emotional. And now on to our next poll. C. diff only affects older adults. <clears throat> and the results are, it is a myth. Wow, very good. C. diff affects more than just older adults. Okay, according to the CDC in the United States, CDI is estimated to cause almost half a million infections with about 30,000 deaths each year. And it was once known as a nuisance disease of older adults, but cases are now commonly found in children and younger adults. And over the past 20 years, CDI has increased among all age groups, but it's still much higher in the older adult population. Now, although half of the infections are in people younger than 65, more than 90% of C. diff-related deaths are in people over 65. About one in 11 people over age 65 diagnosed with it will die within one month. It does increase hospital length of stay between three and six days, and about one in six patients who get C. diff have a recurrence. It is the most common cause of healthcare-associated diarrhea in the long-term care setting. Long-term care IPs should always be on the lookout for it. Now, the CDI-associated costs are between one and five billion dollars per year in the U.S., and unfortunately, CDI may be the beginning of a vicious cycle of recurrence. Now, is C. diff common in children? In neonates and infants, it's actually considered a harmless commensal. And in fact, up to 70% of healthy newborns can become colonized in the first months of life. And most remain asymptomatic, even in the presence of large numbers of toxin-producing bacteria. And it's not really clear why so many have the bacteria but don't get sick, but some think it might be related to the balance of other bacteria living in the gut or due to protection by those maternal antibodies. <clears throat> Severe CDI, it is less common in children than adults, but it does occur, and up to 8% will develop severe disease. However, this is sort of interesting, the incidence of CDI in children in the U.S. has increased with 20,000 cases now reported annually, and three quarters of them are community associated. Now, mortality in children with CDI is between two and 4%, and the global impact of children, of CDI on children, is hard to measure because there's so much wide variation in diagnosis and reporting, but high rates of CDI in children are reported worldwide. Now, let's look at recurrent CDI after another poll. People who have a recurrence can experience a second or third episode. <clears throat> and Fact, uh, excellent, wow, 99%, whoo, I'm impressed, very good. <clears throat> okay, while the public is more aware of CDI than ever, 
the high rate of recurrence hasn't gained as much attention. And recurrent CDI is defined as an episode of symptom onset and a positive assay result after an episode with a positive result in the previous two to eight weeks. And recurrence accounts for about 75,000 to 175,000 additional cases of CDI per year in the United States. Now about 35% of patients who initially respond to antibiotic therapy, which is the standard treatment regimen, experience a recurrence. And up to 65% of people who have a recurrence can experience a second or even a third episode with worse patient outcomes with each recurrence. This vicious cycle of infection reinfection hinders recovery, worsening the burden of CDI. Now, studies have shown that um, occurrence can be due to a relapse of the previous CDI infection by the same strain or reinfection by a different strain. And also that older age and female sex can also increase the risk for recurrence. Some related complications of recurrence are sepsis, colectomy, and a mortality rate of 6% in patients with their first recurrence. Now, it's a horrible disease with a social and emotional toll like anxiety, depression, and isolation. For those of you that want a better understanding of how patients struggle with this disease, take a look at the Peggy Lillis Foundation for C. diff education and advocacy. I've provided a link to the site in the resources page. Now, on a more positive note, in 2023, two microbiome therapeutics were approved for treatment of recurrent CDI, and they show some very promising results. <clears throat> so it's hard to believe we've been keeping an eye on C. diff since 2009, when the C. diff surveillance program was first launched. Now, this slide shows some progress and reduction of C. diff between 2017 and 2019, which is encouraging, but work on reduction needs to continue. In 2019, C. diff was still classified as one of the most urgent antibiotic resistant public health threats in the United States because of its profound morbidity, mortality, and the excess healthcare costs that are associated with it. And we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic delayed reporting of a lot of things, including the reporting on CDI prevalence, but most reporting continued to show a decline. <clears throat> As of 2022, Healthcare-associated CDI continues to decrease, but what's interesting is that the epidemiology of C. diff has shifted and clinicians should be aware that it's no longer an infection that primarily affects people in healthcare facilities. Now in 2020, healthcare-associated CDI was at about 49% and community-associated at 51. So what's changed? Well, it's hard to verify how many cases are truly community associated versus developing in the community, but originating due to exposure to a healthcare environment. And because patients go to many different care settings that can belong to different healthcare networks, it's extremely difficult to determine how many cases are actually occurring within a particular community. And also in the last decades, new strains considered hypervirulent have emerged and they show a shifting trend in the most affected patient populations with an increased incidence of CDI among younger patients. And, and this is sort of troubling, patients without prior exposure to antibiotics. Now, <clears throat> we've confirmed the overlap between C. diff strains that are circulating in the community and among our healthcare associated cases. But what we don't know for sure is the directionality of those transmissions. So even though healthcare contact is frequently associated with community associated CDI, it's really not clear if this is due to patients who are at an elevated risk because of multiple chronic health problems, or if contact with healthcare is what's driving that risk. Now, another poll, C. diff is a global problem. These are all too easy for all of you. I'm glad. <clears throat> All right, yay, it is a global problem and let's dig into why. 
Okay, C. diff infections are increasing in prevalence and are among the most common healthcare associated illnesses globally. But it's not entirely clear why, but there are a few factors that might be responsible. And one might be that C. diff is becoming more resistant to antibiotics because of increased and more widespread use of antibiotics. Or maybe the growing number of elderly and sick patients receiving care has caused an increase. Or it could possibly be the way cleaning and disinfection are performed because recommended practices are not always followed for a whole bunch of reasons, so transmissions can occur. There are also new, more virulent strains of C. diff that have evolved in recent years, and one being ribotype 027, which is one of the principal drivers of ongoing CDI transmission because it appears to spread quickly and cause more severe illness. And looking at the map, you can see ribotype 027 has swept across the globe, indicating that it's acquired an increased ability to cause disease. And maybe the increase is simply due to reporting. Some countries that weren't doing surveillance are now actually looking for it and reporting it. And over the last two decades, most surveillance came from North America and Europe, with few reports from countries like Latin and South America, Africa, and Asia. So that makes it really hard to accurately estimate the global healthcare burden of CDI. Another poll, you can only acquire C. diff from people. Now this is kind of a trick question. Let's see what you know. Oh my gosh. Okay. We should just stop now because you guys know everything, but we'll push ahead. Okay. <laughs> Studies have shown that clinical C. diff isolates are more diverse than we previously thought. Sources for CDI outside of healthcare can potentially challenge our infection prevention efforts because we honestly really only focus on interventions in healthcare. So some potential novel sources to think about are food. Now, some speculate the consumption of C. diff contaminated food is a risk factor for community transmission. And the presence of C. diff in sewage treatment plants might be a major reason for community transmission, transmission to food, and ultimately food contamination. Now, this pie chart is from a study in Asia and Europe, and it shows a variety of foods, but especially seafood is a potential risk for C. diff. Now, there was a review published in Foods Magazine in April of 2023, I'm sure you all subscribe to this, that said patients who are vulnerable to CDI should not consume or handle shellfish or pork. I've never heard of this, so I guess I should subscribe. High rates of colonization are found among livestock, and it's not surprising that contamination of meat products with C. diff has been reported. Now, in the United States, C. diff was found in between 23 and 50% of uncooked meats, in 14% of ready-to-eat summer sausage, and 63% of ready-to-eat Braunschweiger, for you Braunschweiger fans. However, more research is needed to determine the relationship between contaminated food and CDI. This is just another reason I'm glad I'm vegan. Now, household transmissions, despite the increase in community-associated CDI, there's been very little research on the role of household transmission. Having a symptomatic family member is a risk factor for CDI, but the transmission risk is low, and it's only about a half of a percent. And this increased risk was found for up to three months after the occurrence of that index case in your household. So not surprising, contamination of environmental surfaces with C. diff spores was shown to persist in household settings of patients with documented CDI. So really what this does is it highlights the importance of the environment in household transmissions, and perhaps it's an opportunity for education. Then we have environmental reservoirs, and C. diff has been recovered from parks, lawns, soil, beaches, river water, pools, and municipal wastewater, although their significance to transmission is unclear. 
So it's unknown if that environmental contamination is really a true source for disease, or is it simply a consequence of shedding by carriers or infected individuals? Then we have our zoonotic potential. Now C. diff can be found in the intestinal tract of humans and many animals, including our pets, farm animals, and wildlife. And animals can transmit C. diff to people. In fact, high rates of C. diff colonization are found in livestock workers, particularly swine handlers. Now, which factors are driving the emergence and transmission of these zoonotic strains is actually a hot topic right now. And it's currently focused on feed supplements and agricultural antibiotics. So this high degree of diversity of C. diff isolates, the increasing evidence of transmission outside of the hospital environment and multiple potential sources of infection might be contributing to transmissions. So we might need to rethink our prevention efforts to help decrease infections even further. So let's look at some risk factors for CDI. Yep, we have another poll. So certain antibiotics have been associated with a higher risk of C. diff infection. Mary, make it so. Okay, like I said, you guys, you got this going on. I'm glad to hear it. Yep, the next slide will explain this. Okay, so risk factors for CDI include antibiotic use. We know that C. diff most, uh, occurs most often while taking antibiotics or soon after finishing a course of antibiotics, sometimes as soon as one month later. Now, according to the CDC, more than half of the patients hospitalized in the United States will get an antibiotic and 30 to 50% of them will be unnecessary or incorrect. Now, the most common antibiotics associated with C. diff infection are listed on the slide. Um, there is increased risk from gastrointestinal surgery or manipulation of the GI tract, including tube feedings. Length of stay is directly proportional to the risk of acquiring C. diff. Between 13 and 50% of people in the healthcare facility are colonized at any one point in time. There's your risk. Having a serious underlying illness and immunocompromising condition can also increase your risk. Things like cancer, HIV, AIDS, uh, chronic renal disease, chronic liver disease. CDI is more common and causes 90% of deaths in those 65 and older. And then proton pump inhibitor usage, although somewhat controversial, can inhibit gastric acid production leading to the production of spores. And the risk of acquiring C. diff is almost two times higher in PPI users than in non-users. And that risk remains elevated for up to one year after that treatment has ended. And lastly, having had a previous infection with C. diff or exposure to it can increase your risk of infection. So let's look at transmission. We know C. diff is shed in the feces, so transmission mainly occurs by the fecal oral route. And hands make organisms mobile, so any surface or device that becomes contaminated with feces could serve as a reservoir for C. diff spores. And the spores can be transferred to patients by the hands of healthcare workers who have touched a contaminated surface or item. Now, one study found about 59% of healthcare workers caring for C. diff positive patients had hand cultures positive for C. diff. Another study found that in hospital rooms and intensive care units, C. diff contamination was found on 49% of sites in rooms occupied by patients with an active infection. And on 29% of sites in rooms occupied by asymptomatic carriers. And there's also evidence of airborne transmission of C. diff spores during times of heavy activity. Now, researchers suspect the activity like opening and closing doors, people moving about the room, food delivery, or bedding changes. It stirs up the spores that have settled on surfaces, sending them back into the air where they can resettle and possibly be ingested if a surface is touched. <laughs> 
And we know pathogens can survive on surfaces for long periods of time. And you can see C. diff spores can survive on surfaces for five months, and some research speculates even longer. So that long spore survival time increases the risk of transmission from a contaminated surface. Now, there was a study in 2008, I know it sounds old, but it's still relevant, um, of 36 acute care hospitals that found that less than half of all environmental surfaces were properly cleaned. So this means that the patient already in that room or the next patient may risk getting an infection from an improperly cleaned room. Now, according to the World Health Organization, transmission of healthcare associated pathogens like C. diff from one patient to another by a healthcare worker's hands requires five sequential steps. The first is that organisms are on the patient's skin or shed onto inanimate objects immediately in the patient environment. Second is that organisms must be transferred to the healthcare worker's hands. The third is that those organisms must be able to survive for at least a, several minutes on healthcare workers' hands. The fourth is that that hand hygiene must have been inadequate, not performed, or the product inappropriate. And the fifth is that those contaminated hands must come into direct contact with another patient or with an inanimate object that will come in direct contact with that patient. Now, average healthcare hand hygiene compliance in the U.S. is around 40%. And critical care does better, they're about 60%. So if less than half of the services are adequately cleaned and hand hygiene is performed less than half of the time, I think we have a problem. So let's look at prevention and have another poll. This is another easy one. Infection control and prevention measures can help prevent C. diff transmission. I hope no one marks this as a myth. <laughs> okay, yeah, what? Okay, so <laughs> it is a fact, we do have measures. So let's take a look at them. <laughs> and I want that person who marked myth to stay after. Okay. There are two main methods to preventing C. diff infection in healthcare facilities. The first is to decrease a person's risk of developing C. diff infection if they're exposed to it. And this is accomplished through antimicrobial stewardship, which is a program that promotes the appropriate use of antimicrobials. So what this means is prescribing the correct antibiotic at the correct dose for the correct amount of time. The potential to develop CDI if the spores are ingested is much lower if a person does not receive an antibiotic that's not indicated or receives one of those lower CDI risk antibiotics if one is indicated. So smart prescribing can help. Now, the second approach is to prevent transmissions. And this is accomplished by performing appropriate hand hygiene which we all know is the single most important step in reducing the transmission of organisms. We'll talk about hand hygiene for C. diff more in the next slide. And we can prevent the spread by placing patients both with active infection and colonized on transmission-based precautions and having staff consistently wear appropriate personal protective equipment and also by using patient equipment that's single use or dedicated to that patient whenever possible. And we can prevent the spread by having a robust environmental cleaning and disinfection program. Now, cleaning should include the mechanical action of scrubbing or elbow grease. And it's really hard work, but probably as important, if not more so, than any antimicrobial effect of the disinfectant. And cleaning needs to occur before disinfection can be achieved. They are two separate processes. So cleaning with mechanical scrubbing leads to better disinfection because now that disinfectant can touch the surface of the object you want to disinfect. So think of it this way. Cleaning removes the crud, so disinfectants can kill the organisms. Now, I read a study that found using the correct disinfectant could result in a 59% decrease in CDI cases. So that translates to 59,000 less CDI cases 
and 82,000 fewer deaths over a five-year period. And if you're worried about money, you'll have a savings of $2.5 billion. Now, one thing I can't stress enough, disinfectants are only part of a comprehensive, multi-tiered infection control program. Please do not simply rely on that disinfectant to get the job done. Make it a part of a robust cleaning and disinfection program. All right, so hand hygiene. Well, hand hygiene is defined as a method to clean one's hands that substantially reduces potential pathogens. And one method is hand washing, right? So that's washing hands with plain soap and water using a rubbing motion or friction to help remove debris. Now the soap softens and suspends soils and organisms so they can be rinsed away. So hand washing is the mechanical removal of microorganisms and debris because it relies on that friction. This is why the CDC recommends the use of soap and water after removing your gloves if your hands are visibly soiled or dirty. Now, the second method of hand hygiene is using that alcohol-based hand rub. And that's rubbing hands with the 60 to 90% alcohol-containing preparation. 70% is the sweet spot because it has more water, which helps it dissolve more slowly, penetrate and kill bacteria better, and it evaporates more slowly. So if your hands are not visibly soiled or dirty, alcohol-based hand rub is recommended. So which one are we supposed to use when we're caring for a C. difficile patient? Alcohol-based hand rub shouldn't be used when caring for C. diff patients. This one I'm interested to see how you all answer. And it's not a trick question. Should not, okay, well, okay. Let's take a look at the recommendations. Okay, so alcohol-based hand rubs are known to be less effective on soiled hands and specifically not effective against those C. diff resistant spores. But the CDC and other professional organizations agree there's a right time to use each when you're caring for patients with C. diff because, and this is important, there is no single method of hand hygiene that will eliminate all C. diff spores. So when should you use soap and water? Use soap and water if your institution is experiencing a hyperendemic situation or an outbreak. So hyperendemic situations are when your C. diff infection rates are over your target level or outbreaks are occurring. This is when soap and water is recommended for hand hygiene. Now, this is important too, because this recommendation is based on the theoretical benefit of the physical removal and dilution of spores from the hands by washing, not killing those spores. It's that friction that really helps. One thing I really need to stress, and I hope you all remember this, is that Healthcare workers should not re-enter the patient room after removing their PPE to perform soap and water hand hygiene. And they should not perform soap and water hand hygiene in the patient restroom or near the bedside if a sink is located there. What you should do is after removing your PPE and exiting that patient room, you should use an alcohol-based hand rub. Then immediately look for a designated hand hygiene sink to wash with soap and water. Don't go back in that room. You should use alcohol-based hand rub for routine patient care, which is when your C. diff target infection rate is where you expect it to be. Now, the rationale behind alcohol-based hand rub is that it's used to prevent the spread of all HAIs, including C. diff, because it promotes or increases adherence to hand hygiene compared to soap and water, it has a broader spectrum of efficacy against microorganisms, and it reduces the risk of those MDROs better than soap and water. It's for these reasons you should not remove alcohol-based hand rub from the rooms of patients with C. diff. So if your hands are not visibly soiled or dirty after performing that routine care and carefully removing your PPE, you can use alcohol-based hand rub. And remember, using gloves to prevent hand contamination is the best protection 
for preventing C. diff transmission. And just for a peace of mind, there have been no studies in the acute care setting that show an increase in CDI with alcohol-based hand rubs or a decrease in CDI with traditional hand washing with soap and water. Okay, EPA registered hospital disinfectants are available that are effective against C. diff spores. I'm hoping this is 100%. Okay. We there? Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about this. Okay, the importance of preventing environmental contamination cannot be emphasized enough. Patients in rooms previously occupied by patients with an MDRO like C. diff have been shown to be at risk for acquiring that organism. And the environment is even more important for spore forming organisms like C. diff because they can live on hard surfaces for such a long time. Now it's been shown that as levels of environmental contamination increase, so does the prevalence of C. diff spores on healthcare worker hands. So that environment is a critical source of contamination and it increases the potential for the spread of infection. So to reduce that contamination, make sure the environment and items that are touched frequently or shared are adequately cleaned and disinfected. Consider dedicated disposable equipment whenever possible because this leads to a reduction in that risk of hand contamination. Perform daily and terminal cleaning and disinfection of patients' rooms with an EPA-registered hospital sporocidal disinfectant, go to that EPA list K. Remember that cleaning must be performed before dis disinfection. If that disinfectant can't touch the surface, then disinfection hasn't taken place. And if you're interested, ultraviolet disinfection has become a widely used and promising adjunct technology after cleaning to help reduce spores. Now, I wanted to talk about this study that was done recently. There's been some talk about this paper, and with good reason. It calls into question the use of sodium hypochlorite as being ineffective against C. diff spores on soft surfaces, in this instance, scrubs or uniforms. So I wanted to point out a few things when I read this paper. So first of all, it's a laboratory experiment, and I don't think it represents real-world contamination of uniforms with C. diff. If healthcare workers are wearing and removing PPE appropriately, they shouldn't be grossly contaminated. So now might be a good time to reinforce the importance of wearing and removing PPE for every patient encounter, even if you're running into that room for just a minute. Regarding hospital gowns, sure, they're more likely to see high levels of contamination, especially if they're soiled. But hospital linens, like patient gowns that are commercially laundered, they're not just exposed to bleach, and really neither are items that are laundered at home. So there's a common misconception that laundering kills all microorganisms, which would be equal to sterilization, but that it's not the case. Microbial control in laundry is called sanitizing and reduces the number of microorganisms to safe levels. So looking at the commercial washing process, it relies on dilution and agitation in water to wash away microorganisms like the friction on our hands, soaps and detergents to suspend soil, and it does show some microbiocidal properties, hot water to kill some organisms, chlorine bleach is used to add an additional margin of safety, and then they do this thing called souring, which is adding an acid to a pH of five, which helps kill more microorganisms, and then there's drying, with also aids in killing microorganisms. So it's not just bleach. Another point about this paper is that it was a soft surfaces study. And most EPA-registered disinfectants are for use on hard, non-porous surfaces only. Currently, there is no EPA test method for disinfection of C. diff on soft surfaces. This paper used UK standards, which are different from US standards. And all bleach products aren't created equal. They have different formulations that vary their effectiveness. And the study did not follow a standard test method. 
Now, this paper raised some interesting questions, but I wouldn't discard our best practices and recommendations just yet. I'd wait for more information and studies designed to mimic real world situations. So until we know, know more, follow the CDC recommendations for washing of clothing, including staff uniforms. Wash your uniforms separately from your other laundry and don't shake them out. Remember that airborne transmission. Use the recommended detergent and be sure you dry them. Perform hand hygiene after handling and clean that washer and dryer after you've used them with your uniforms. But also think about changing clothes if you're worried about bringing something home. Um, the people you encounter on your way home from work, on public transportation, in restaurants, and the grocery store would probably appreciate it, and not just because of C. diff. So here's the answers to the facts versus myth slides. Some of the challenges to, that make stopping transmission difficult are hand hygiene compliance, PPE use, cleaning and disinfection practices, that widespread outpatient healthcare contact, asymptomatic colonization, that darn environmental persistence of those spores, inconsistent screening and reporting, and those potential novel sources. But we do have infection prevention and control methods that can help reduce or stop the spread. PPE is the first line of defense, so knowing how to wear it, and more importantly, how to safely remove it is critical to preventing those transmissions. Train and monitor healthcare workers on appropriate and consistent use of PPE, especially that doffing, because that's where we usually see contamination occur. Educate and observe those practices regularly. IPs, get out on your units and see what's happening. It can be a real eye opener. Follow the hand hygiene recommendations for routine and hyperdemic outbreak situations, and be sure you're screening and implementing transmission based precautions as soon as possible. Use an EPA-registered sporocidal hospital disinfectant from list K to help stop transmissions. Cleaning is how we reduce the number of spores present and allow that disinfectant to get to the surface and do its job. <clears throat> For an extra measure, consider using a proven adjunct technology like UVC as part of your room discharge plan. But carefully evaluate these products and look for real-world use results. And if you're worried about healthcare worker uniforms becoming contaminated, follow the CDC recommendations for laundering until we have more information. So these measures, when used together as part of your infection control plan, can make a big difference in organism transmissions and not just for C. diff. Stick with the facts. You know them really well. Thank you. 